Um, today we're going to talk about the technology that's been discussed by our other uh, presenters, but uh, in lesions that present in combination, and we're going to talk about the rationale for that. Um, this is an example of the uh, philosophy and the surgical principles when you're dealing with combination lesions. Uh, in this example, we're using a biologic resurfacing um, mode in an osteoarticular allograft transplant, but the principles remain the same, chasing down the lesions, extirpating them, and then anatomically resurfacing it. And in this instance, we're using an osteoarticular allograft transplant. This was a 27-year-old who really he failed multiple arthroscopies, failed uh, multiple uh, attempts at conservative management, and had no joint space narrowing, and the standard of care and you know, in um, in uh, alternative to this is wait for total knee, um, and he did not want to wait, and he did not want a total knee, and he's certainly too young. So you can kind of see the uh, post-op MRs here with the cartil cartilage transplant, basically um, post-operatively here um, resurfacing um, anatomically the uh, sulcus terminalis. He actually came to my office about three weeks ago for follow-up for his wrist, and I was able to snap a few pictures of his knee. He's not swelling anymore. He's doing well. Um, he, didn't, he did not want to get x-rays. He wasn't in for his knee. He was in for his wrist. So um, in this instance, we were able to uh, um, definitely buy him some time for further treatment, and he's turned out um, he, he's had a good result. Those surgical principles, though, become more important in the older patient um, where Biologics, uh, as recent literature has suggested, aren't as successful, and um, unfortunately with some of the older patients, their presentation is more frequent. Uh, and it's a very nice uh, lateral kind of uh, transition to be able to use uh, the Arthur surface instrumentation employing these same surgical principles because of the ability to uh, intraoperatively 3D map the joint curvatures and match these perfectly and um, take advantage of the ability to, to basically fit the, the uh, components to the patient. And the way you can do that uh, is based on the fact that there's now, I guess, over 80 articular sizes and shapes for the knee. Uh, so this gives you the ability and flexibility to be able to map uh, the uh, the, uh, the lesions appropriately and uh, basically take the uh, implants and fit them for the patients. Just as a background, uh, background information, there's about 33 million people in the U.S. that are afflicted with osteoarthritis. And recent studies have shown that arthroscopies in the United States total about 1.5 million scopes per year, 4 million as, perspective, as a perspective worldwide. But out of those 1.5 uh, million arthroscopies in the United States, about 300,000 per year have concomitant medial compartment um, uh, degeneration, as we'll talk about. And just as a perspective, because it really is apples and oranges, uh, there's about 581,000 uh, total knees performed per year in the U.S. So the advantages in treating these lesions, chasing down these lesions, and using this type of instrumentation is from what was discussed from the other presenters, that the knee biomechanics essentially, as we're observing this, are left intact because it's an inlay resurfacing because of the precise measurements that we are able to make and match that with precise articular components because we've got, we have a lot of options. So the, the, the distinct advantage is that not only is this approach meniscal sparing, ligamentous sparing, uh, and cartilage sparing in non-affected lesions, but we do not overstuff the joint, and therefore we can maintain the soft tissue tension um, in, in, the, in the knee and allow for a more normal, more biomechanically sound knee with the inlay, uh, inlay resurfacing. Here's an example of this that you guys have seen throughout this morning, and this is an example of this, and, and you've seen this, but there's not a lot of bone resection, and the reason for that is uh, because of the way 
the implants are, are manufactured. They're not forged. They're milled. And when you mill something, you can make it thinner, but it's more durable. And that allows us to minimize bone resection. So that's a very important point um, because you want durability, but you also want the thinness that minimizes your bone, um, your, 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 your bone resection, so it's bone sparing. We talked about it being meniscal sparing. And uh, basically, with the AKR, again, um, impl imp it's a natural transition uh, from someone who's, who's done transplants to now have this technology available for older patients to be able to employ this in, in a setting where you have combination lesions for the advantages that have been mentioned earlier. And here's some examples of the technique that we won't get into now. We'll get into that in the lab. But here's an example of how the lesion can uh, match the conformity of the condyle. The same can be said about the patellofemoral uh, component. Again, um, it's milled, and you could see on this slide, very minimal bone resection uh, allows us, uh, with this very durable implant, to basically reconstruct the trochlea. Um, and uh, it provides a lot of advantage. This is an example of the wave, but there's also the classic that you guys will see in the laboratory as well. This is how they all start. They're bars of cobalt chrome, and then going from uh, left to right, um, we will get closer toward the finished product until it's finished at the end, and it's a very time consuming process that one has to appreciate and um, basically this is what allows us to make these implants thin and durable. Going from the basic science, the, the, the literature is very interesting. When you recess these implants, one of the things that was noted in, in, in the GOAT studies that were done initially, uh, and this was published in 2006, is that if these implants are are positioned appropriately recessed that you observe a overgrowth phenomena of articular cartilage. And in this study, what was interesting was when they looked at the photomicrographs that the superficial layer was continuous. Now obviously this is a smaller implant, but uh, this phenomenon is a very interesting phenomenon. I, I really don't have any um, explanation as to why that occurs, but this is organized cartilage, as you can see on the, the uh, micrograph, and it's a very interesting phenomenon. What I take home from it as a clinician is that if you're seeing cartilage grow in, you're offloading the perimeter, which, as we know, when we have lesions at a critical size, 20 millimeters in circumference, that's when edge loading occurs, and that's when these lesions propagate. Uh, I don't have an explanation as to why this happens. Perhaps Dr. Miniachi may be able to better, uh, or, or Dr. Uribe uh, may be able to better explain that phenomena. But um, it's a very interesting phenomena. The, the take home message that I have clinically is that when I see that, um, I feel that, uh, that what we're observing in a dynamic fashion, and I'll have some more data to, to discuss this, is that perhaps we're stopping this propagation, which is an all too important step uh, in the progression of osteoarthritis. Um, also what's important to note is when the implants are recessed, uh, the question of a metal coming into contact with normal articular cartilage is answered in that the stresses uh, experienced are, are normal, uh, meaning there's no significant difference. This is one study that was done and the text scan data was basically identical, but you only needed to be one millimeter proud where you saw a significant jump in the, uh, in the joint contact pressures. Another study re reproduced this. As you could see, the blue is untreated uh, in terms of the contact tibial pressures, and the pink uh, demonstrates uh, the implant that's recessed, okay, and virtually identical um, peak contact pressures, and then you do the classic meniscus uh, radial tear experiment, and you see a big jump in the contact uh, pressures. Um, so recessing the implants, very critical uh, for those two aspects in terms of the cartilage overgrowth phenomena that um, we're observing clinically and the, the contact pressures that are observed uh, in those respective uh, compartments, and that's pretty consistent with what we know with biologics as well. 
One of the key things that I uh, do in my practice, and I'm in private practice in Chicago, one of the most critical selecting um, selection criteria that I use as far as you know histories and, and physical examination and everything, uh, and having scoped some of these patients, uh, but before I even get to that, the Rosenberg view I find to be in, very, very important. And in, in my area, you know, I see a fair amount of second opinions, and I, I see a lot of patients that have come to me that have scopes that, you know, haven't had appropriate x-rays. Um, this view, you know, I had to kind of dig up this article. This is from 1989, uh, but it was interesting uh, just to review. It's, it's more accurate than extension weight-bearing films. It's more specific and more sensitive. And if you have a one to two millimeter side-to-side -side difference from the other uh, uh, knee, that corresponds to grade three and four Connor Malaysia, according to Rosenberg and Lonnie Paulus, because uh, they actually scoped all these patients and painstakingly documented all that. So it's a very important view that I, I keep in my, um, I keep in my um, uh, uh, patient selection uh, criteria. We'll go, get into the surgery later, but what, what I typically do you know, a lot of these patients have had scopes and they failed and they've gone through visco supplementation and they failed bracing. And, you know, these lesions are crit at critical mass where we all know, based on literature, no matter what you do, chondroplasties, uh, everything doesn't seem to have long term uh, results. And a fair amount of, of patients in my practice are workers' comp patients. And so these patients are out of work, you know, everyone's unhappy, the case workers are unhappy, and they're wondering what's going on. And, and you know they're out of work and they're not progressing. So, you know after they've gone through all of those uh, um, uh, aspects of treatment and they failed conservative management, they still have preserved joint space on the Rosenberg view. Then I will talk to them and discuss with them about resurfacing. I'm going to briefly go over the rehab, uh, one of the and, and and skip over the techniques because that's going to be addressed in the lab. But one of the things that I do uh, right away is I, I get them going with range of motion, but I do not weight bear them. And the re rationale for not weight bearing them is that these are plasma sprayed posteriorly on the implant. And the whole idea here is to get a biologic fixation. Now there's two types, there's uh, in-growth and, and on-growth. So this would be an on-growth because we're not dealing with pore sizes. But all the literature that we know, and most of it comes from total hip literature, specifies that for biologic fixation to occur, we cannot have micromotion greater than 50 to 150 microns. And typically, we need a time frame, and it's anywhere from four to six weeks. And I don't do total joints, but I've kind of, in, I've kind of adopted that principle, and I think it's done right by me. But it does not mean that I can't aggressively treat these in physical therapy and work on active and passive range of motion. It's just that I get away from weight bearing these patients because especially when you're dealing with a 20 by 40 millimeter uh, condylar implant, there is, I believe, a lot of potential for micromotion, which if it occurs, then you're dealing with a fibrous rather than a bony uh, fixation scenario, which may be a source of post-op pain. So I've el eliminated that variable completely uh, in my practice. I've come up with the classification scheme to kind of um, categorize these patients that don't have collapse on their Rosenberg views. And this scheme has not been validated, but it helps me in my practice as I'm looking at these patients to try to identify who is going to do well and who's not going to do well. Because not everyone's going to have tibial involvement. In fact, what I've observed is that the majority of these patients, if you're getting them early, are going to have more involvement on the condyle than the tibia. So if there's no tibial involvement, then as a clinician, I'm put in a scenario where I'm gonna use this in an off-label uh, fashion because I'm not using the tibial implant because I do not feel the pathology justifies putting a, a poly uh, on the tibia when there's nothing there. So I've come up with a classification system to kind of reflect this and it helps me not only track my patients, but it also helps me communicate to my patients preoperatively. So basically, the classification system is based on an ISR, uh, ICRS grade three or four with uh, being at risk for a 20 millimeter, uh, uh, being at risk for propagation by having a 20 millimeter defect. And so it's, it's fairly intuitive. A 1A lesion just has medial femoral condyle involvement. 
A 1B lesion has a kissing lesion on the tibial plateau that you want to resurface. A 2A lateral femoral condyle, 2B lateral femoral condyle plus lateral tibial plateau, 3A just the trochlea, and 3B the trochlea and the patella. So here's some schematic representations of these examples, a 1A and a 1B, 2A and a 2B, 3A and a 3B. Um, and again, it's not validated. It's more for me uh, to track these patients and also consulting you know, with my patients preoperatively. And here's some examples of a 1A and a 3A. So we resurfaced the lateral side and the uh, trochlea with a classic here. This is a 1A, 2A, and 3B. So we ended up doing the patellofemoral joint and uh, the medial and lateral sides. And these are patients that do not meet the criteria for a, a, a total joint, but they don't want to wait for a total joint. And right now, that's the standard of care. So this technology actually allows us to challenge that standard that has been frustrating a lot of clinicians and patients, uh, more, more so patients alike. We have a series uh, that of about 14 patients right now where um, we've uh, collected data that have met these strict criteria uh, for combination resurfacing, and we're going to come up to our two-year follow-up with all of them very soon. This is one patient that had failed two uh, scopes. He's in his um, mid-40s to late-40s and um, failed a couple scopes and failed visco supplementation, did not want to wait for a total knee, and um, uh, did not want a total knee. So we ended up uh, resurfacing after he's failed conservative management. He's about at a year and a half uh, post-op, and we actually scored him just prematurely, and he did pretty well. Pain scores were good, functions were good. Stiffness has been a consistent uh, issue, I would say, but that seems to get better. Uh, with time, and those were subjective scores. This is a, a gentleman, uh, another example uh, of one of the combo lesions that we treated. It's a gentleman, fairly large. Uh, he's about six foot four, 320 pounds, and he's a laborer. He's a work comp patient. And you'll be able to appreciate once I run the video, but his right knee, the non work related knee, had a pre existing condition of lateral compartment arthritis, as you can see from the accentuated valgus. He was bone on bone. He also had a femoral nerve um, palsy uh, from an old injury, uh, and he had quad dysfunction on his EMG. So his right knee was always a problem. And then he actually came to me with a uh, 1A, 3B lesion. We scoped him, and it just wasn't getting better. This had to be his good knee, because his other knee, uh, as a laborer, wasn't cutting it. And you know, workers' comp wasn't even addressing the other knee, because it wasn't work-related. So we had to get back to work. So we ended up, after failing all the visco supplementation and, and the arthroscopy and knowing with the fact that these lesions were going to progress, and this had to be his good knee, we ended up resurfacing him. And then uh, at three months, literally, uh, he, he made this his good knee. And he literally, as you could tell from his gait, relies on that knee um, not only to walk and function, but get back to work. Um, here's another patient. Um, she uh, came to me for a scope, uh, and she, she again had a 1A, 3B lesion. I went in for the meniscus. Uh, the MR uh, wasn't very clear on as to how much uh, cartilaginous involvement was noted, but when we got in there, she had significant 1A and 3B disease and did not do well after the scope, in fact, was in agony. And uh, I was worried about spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee post, post arthroscopy because of the dramatic complaints that she was having. And uh, she was just in agony. We did the visco supplementation, nothing was working. And uh, she you know, could not get off of the pain meds in the walker. And about three months post her scope, she said, You got to do something. I don't want a total knee. She wasn't a candidate for it uh, because she had preserved joint spaces. So we ended up resurfacing her. And she's done uh, fairly well. She's at more than eight months now. She's probably at about 22 months now, but this video was taken when she was at eight months. Her main complaints postoperatively after we did the resurfacing was mainly medial hamstring tendonitis and patellar tendonitis, which I ended up injecting in the office with PRP. And since then, we've got her 
back to a, a, a very good functional level. We've had a couple second looks uh, in our series. Um, two patients had fat pad impingement, and I think it's technique related on my part. What I do with my approach in some instances, especially if I need to get posteriorly, I will cut the anterior horn of the meniscus and then repair it, because I know they're going to be non-weight bearing, and I use uh, a, uh, a cascade uh, PRP to help do the repairs, and in the second looks, all those menisci have healed. Um, and I feel that the PRP have, may have caused a, a proliferative response with the fat pad, and I've had in my series a higher than anticipated um, incidence of fat pad impingement. In most instances, those have gone away, and the diagnosis was made by localizable tenderness and then relief with an injection in the office. But in a couple cases in our series, I've had to go back and just debride the fat pad. And when I did that, that afforded us the opportunity to not only do a second look, but also biopsy. Uh, this is a patient a year out, had fat pad impingement, and uh, just didn't, didn't do well. And uh, we did the injections, they helped, and then it would come back. And so uh, we ended up scoping her again. And you can see kind of the same uh, stuff that we noticed um, with the earlier studies. And in fact, what I'm hearing um, in Europe and uh, some other countries that have had the opportunity to do second looks is that they're finding the same um, area wherever the, the implant is recessed, we see cartilage overgrowth. In this case, it's anywhere from three to five millimeters, but wherever the implant's recessed, we see that on a consistent basis. And I've had three cases where I've um, had to go back, two for the fat pad impingement, one was for lysis of adhesions, and we've observed this. And uh, in, in this case, what we did was we did a biopsy of the medial femoral condyle. You can see it's pretty or organized cartilage. And as some of you may know, if you're familiar with this instrumentation, you've got sharp boundaries. So when you're implanting these recessed, I mean, there's a very distinct space. It's a tight space, but there's a very di distinct space between the implant and then, and then you've got your cartilage margin. So for you to see this kind of overgrowth is very, very uh, impressive. What I take from it is that I think the implant is doing its job, uh, you know, based on this preliminary data and offloading that perimeter and um, hopefully stopping the propagation of these lesions. But it's very interesting when you have histology like this showing that you've got organized um, chondrocytes. Um, this was from the patella which looks more fiber cartilage, cartilaginous and less uh, organized. This is another case. Um, this was a gentleman that came to me after a couple knee, knee arthroscopies. He's about three, he goes anywhere from 340 to 390 pounds. He's like five foot 10 and he's diabetic. And um, we scoped him the first time and he just had significant medial disease, very tra trace involvement in the patellofemoral joint. So I recommended at that time a high tibial osteotomy, and I, I significantly uh, corrected him, uh, overcorrected him, and removed the hardware. And it lasted for about a year, a year and a half, and then his pain came back. And we tried conservative management um, with injections and bracing and everything. Nothing worked, and so I ended up scoping him again. And he had tricompartmental involvement, but no joint space collapse. He was in his early 50s. And um, so with our, uh, with our uh, um, options left, we went ahead and, and, and resurfaced his 1A, 2A, 3B lesion. And you could see here, um, this was the one that got stiff at about 12 weeks. And I ended up scoping him again and doing a lysis of adhesions on both gutters. And what you could see here is, again, the phenomenon of uh, overgrowth. In fact, this is what I call the double meniscus sign, because in the area where I would expect to see this uh, cartilage just get beat up uh, at that interface as the knee is going through flexion and hitting the flare of the meniscus coming down, I didn't observe that at all. In fact, we're observing overgrowth. This is the area where I would anticipate in someone being that heavy uh, to be at risk for delaminating articular cartilage, and in fact, that's not what we observed. And his tibia, um, his tibia is w relatively well um, preserved as well, as you can see here. Um, 
and then we'll go to the patella also. And I'm still waiting on his, his biopsy also. I don't have his biopsy results to, uh, to present to you guys today, but we will be uh, getting that and hopefully submitting that. Um, but yeah, you can see here, and this is his patellofemoral joint. Um, you can see the phenomenon again in the trochlea. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see as we get some more of these biopsy results, you know, if the trochlear cartilage is more disorganized, you know, and why, but uh, on the medial femoral condyle, as you saw earlier, those, um, those slides looked like pretty, pretty, organ pretty organized chondrocytes. So at this point, with our preliminary results uh, of a series of only 14 patients that have kind of gone through this weed, weed, weed out process with strict criteria, um, we've observed uh, full range of motion good to excellent results, and all the patients recommended the procedure. And the uh, initial uh, Womax scores are, uh, for pain and function are, are, are pretty good. Again, we talked about the complications of fat pad impingement and lysis of adhesions, and that's how we got our, our data for the second looks. We also had another patient here who uh, I saw, he was a workers' comp patient, he was on medications and on a cane for like three years and addicted basically and I saw him as an independent evaluation and he ended up treating with me. He was told he had to wait for total knee and he was off of work and uh, it was just, uh, you know, so we went in and we scoped him and uh, found out he had a 1A, 2A, 3, 3A lesion and we resurfaced him and then we got him in with pain management to help get him off the narcotics but we were able to get him back to work with a kneeling restriction. That's the other thing that I want to tell you. With my patients that I, I do with the patellofemoral joint, I, I do give them a kneeling restriction. I just think it's unrealistic to have a worker uh, kneel on, on that. I'm just not, so that's the one restriction that I, I do have. But um, we're, we're pretty much getting them up to their level of, um, close to the level of pre-injury state, but I, I do put that work restriction on them. This is that patient, he showed up for our follow-up when we, we started doing the follow-up on our, on our, our, our uh, cohort. And um, all of a sudden I noticed he had two screws here on the tibia that he didn't have before. And he said, oh yeah, uh, doc, by the way, I was uh, in a motorcycle accident. I was driving 70 miles an hour and a car hit me and I was taken to the hospital and they, I had a tibial plateau fracture and uh, they did an RIF and the guy who did it did a nice job and um, you know this is the uh, slides of the patient you could see him here this is after he uh, came back from his tibial plateau but one of the things that I always worried about and I think what's nice with the options that you have in this system is that when you're especially addressing the patellofemoral joint with your first step with your guide as you reference off of the trochlear notch, and if your your um, if your footprint on the guide goes over the top of the cartilage and hits the anterior cortex, when you're using the wave, I drop down to the classic because I'm always worried about that taking uh, that amount of bone. But um, in this case, you know, we avoid we avoided that. But if if in that first step I ever see that, I always drop down to the classic just to avoid taking bone that may hit that anterior cortex. Uh, which would cause a stress riser. In this case, um, these implants uh, did not appear to, to be the weak link in uh, that, that injury, which uh, to me was uh, very interesting. Um, so with that said, I know we're kind of running late on time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and see if there's any questions. Any advice for exposing uh, on the lateral side? Well, what I do, I adjust the lateral side or combos? Just combos where you're doing medial and lateral, and uh, you have to get that lateral Yeah, side. what I do is, I do a couple things. And this, I kind of took over from when I was doing uh, multiples on my, on my transplants. The first thing I do is I, I do a quick scope. I've had scoped these before, but I do a quick scope. And what I do is I just confirm, you know, what I'm dealing with, and I also do a arthroscopic lateral release because I find that to be a lot easier and way more effective. These are all medial parapatellar approaches. But to get lateral, and, and you'll find this, if, if you do, and what I do with my portals is I'll do a, 
I'll do a horizontal laterally and then I'll do a vertical. I, I rarely make vertical portals medially, but in this instance, I'll make a vertical portal medially and I'll do all my work, I'll do my lateral release and I'll take everything out and, um, and then I'll make my incision. Now, the other thing that I like about doing a scope is I'll take the top bar of my uh, leg holder off and now I can manipulate the height of my bed and then I have a fixed table that I bring in with, with um, you know, uh, five pound sand pegs that I tape down to the table and it's a sterile table. So what that allows me to do during the case is if I bring the bed up or down, I can control the flexion angle and get posteriorly. Okay, now during the approach, if I'm gonna do all three of them, I won't mess around. I'll make, or, or a, um, or a uh, combo on the patella, I won't mess around. I'll take the anterior horn of the meniscus, tag it, okay, because I'm gonna repair it at the end, tag it, and then I'll leave the attachments firm on the, um, on the medial side, okay, because I'm preserving the blood supply. Uh, I'll take it down off of, the, um, off of the fat pad and preserving the blood supply, okay, of the anterior horn of the meniscus as it becomes the inner meniscal ligament. And uh, that gives me exposure to everything. That, that, that big incision gives me exposure to everything. And it, and it is very important because you wanna make sure that your implants are appropriately positioned. So, and then you know you use your your Z retractors, and uh, now with your exposure, moving your your bed height with the fixed table where the foot is allows you to get posteriorly as well. So. So you, so you are releasing the anterior horn of the meniscus gives you that. Absolutely, but at the end when I'm all done, I repair it. I'll I'll use some 2O ethabon and I'll incorporate some Cascade uh, membrane. I like the membrane, but when I initially started doing this before the membrane was around, I was using the uh, Cascade, uh, the, the normal, uh, the first generation uh, PRP, and I was repairing those, and uh, my, you know, my second looks have been fine. They haven't had any meniscal complaints at all. All my second looks have healed. I've got video to show that. Um, but the, what I'm getting away with when I do that also is I'm keeping them non-weight bearing for six weeks because I want biologic ingrowth for the femoral component. So at the same time, my meniscus is healing because I'm not weight bearing on it, but I'm doing everything else with it. Have you ever done a bifocal? Uh, a bifocal. No, I have not. Uh, I've done um, I've done one um, tibia. I've been getting these lesions early in my practice. The only time I did a tibia was when I was a guest lecturer in Argentina and. And I went in there and, and we did a tibia. So in my practice, I, I've been getting these earlier. And as a result, I haven't, I haven't done the tibias. As an estimate, what is your operative time in front of a 1B and a 3B? A 1B and a 3B, uh, tourniquet time is less than two hours. And that includes the scope. And I put the tourniquet up before I prep. A lot of these knees have various deformity, meniscal pathology, Condylar lesion, like you're seeing there. Some systems, uni knee systems, talk about correcting that various deformity, thereby taking away the forces that get you here in the first place. But this is really just accepting that various deformity and resurfacing it and not changing it. So I'm wondering, you know, what your thoughts are in terms of the other philosophy of correcting the deformity especially over a three to five, eight year follow-up time period. I mean, is this going to have lead failure because the virus isn't corrected? And what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I think that's an excellent question. And as you know, I mean, the follow-up right now is two years. Um, I think when you add variables, like I, I, obviously we, we know from our data that um, osteotomies are beneficial for the medial compartment, but in this case, we're doing the patellofemoral joint. And um, as far as the benefit or what impact um, is on that, I've had discussions with this with uh, Wayne Paprowski in our area, who's um, uh, a reconstruction guy. And he feels that if you do osteotomies, uh, you know, you may have an adverse effect on the patella. I mean, he, he's got his own beliefs on that. Um, 
what I've done with this series, and I've been very careful because um, you know this is kind of an evolving uh, technology and evolving application with um, um, you know very um, strictly defined surgical principles. I've kind of limited the um, variables of introducing an osteotomy, um, you know, unless there's really excessive excessive varus, which I haven't seen in my series. We're not really doing any bony manipulation. We're we're dealing with the cartilage lesion proper. So it, it you know with this system by itself, you're you're not able to correct that. One thing I would like to add though is based on the data that we're finding out with the um, the the observed overgrowth, as you'll see when you're you're encountering lesions, you have the temptation to kind of rotate your your guides so that you um, uh, try to cover the lesion. Now I know that I don't have to be 100% on the lesion. If some of that's not covered, uh, I feel confident that by unloading the uh, by unloading that area, that what we've observed with the cartilage overgrowth, uh, if I'm not perfectly over it, I'm not worried because I feel that that cartilage overgrowth is going to occur. That phenomena is going to occur because that area will be unloaded, and I think it's better and more important to be aligned uh, appropriately in reference to your condyle than try to get everything you know, covered as far as your lesion goes. So you know, the, the initial tendency when I started was to rotate this to cover the lesion 100%. Now, if I get most of the lesion and then there's small areas of that lesion that aren't covered at the perimeter, I'm not so worried because I feel that by offloading that perimeter, which is what we've seen from the basic science and now we're starting to see on the clinical follow-up that that lesion will take care of itself.